It's an awesome opportunity. We start a new year and we get to start with a baptism. Uh, and many of you know Money. Uh, he's been in, in amongst our church for a while and none of us have questioned his salvation. We, we know he's a believer, seen the fruits in his life. Uh, but he came to us a couple weeks ago and said, hey, I know I'm saved, but I've got my baptism and my salvation out of order. And I want to get that right. And so he's come today to do that. So money, with your public profession of faith, I baptize you, brother, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm buried with Christ in death, raised to walk in newness of life. Come on, buddy. Man, we love that young man, don't we? He has he is a joy. Man, if we all had the excitement and the joy of serving the Lord like he has, man, it would be no doubt, no ending to what we could do in this community and world. What a great way to start 2019. We're going to worship together. We've got this beautiful sunny day the Lord has made for us just to remind us, hey, he's still in control. Amen? Let's stand together. He is worthy of all the worship that we can give today. Worthy of worship, worthy of praise, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all the glad songs we can sing, worthy of all of the offerings we To give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. 
taking my sin, my cross, my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. But it's great to see you here today. As already been mentioned, as we have a first opportunity to gather for worship this new year, I'm glad you've taken advantage of this opportunity and are here today. For our guests today, we're honored by your presence. Uh, other than your presence to us, if you would take your bulletin, which hopefully you got when you came in, and there is a perforated section on the back. If you would fill that out sometime between now and the end of the service and then place that in the offering plate at the end of the service, just as your uh, record of your attendance and uh, so that we also can follow up with you. If you've been here the last few weeks, you know we've been focusing on international missions. It is that time of the year when we uh, focus on international missions and take up our Lottie Moon Christmas offering for international missions where 100% of what is given goes straight to the mission field. We have a couple more weeks that we'll collect that offering and you see in the bulletin where we are in relation to, to our goal. Oftentimes today when, when we turn on the news, uh, when we look at conditions in the world, Islam is on the forefront uh, of many minds, of many issues that we face, those uh, who are, or we would often say, just are Muslims. Maybe what we don't understand, though, is that we are living in the midst of the greatest time in history of Muslims turning to faith in Jesus Christ. One man defined a movement as a time when, when you can find a thousand baptized believers or a hundred new churches in a Muslim community. And using that definition, he found that in the first 12 years of the 21st century, there were 69 movements among countries that are notably Islamic. If we look in countries that are notably Christianity, by the way, you find no such movements during those same 12 years. These movements are occurring across the world even as Muslims face death and violent persecution if their faith is discovered. Many of them worship in underground small groups that makes the exact number and location hard to determine, but it's estimate, estimated that between two and seven million, which I know is a large gap, between two and seven million Muslims have faith, placed their faith in Jesus Christ just since the year 2000. And that's a lot of that's due to the, our missions efforts. So I want to encourage you to continue to give, continue to pray, and, and look for opportunities to be involved even as, as we go in places. I've got classmates I went to college and seminary with that are serving in some of these places uh, where they've been serving faithfully, and, and they're not in this, this movement. Some of them have been in places three, five years and have yet to see anyone place their faith in Jesus. So as we share about the great victories, there's still a lot of work to do. There's still a lot of frustrations even. So I want to encourage us to be reminded of the need. Again, I'm thankful that you're here today. That we come and we get to sing about the Lord indeed being our all in all. And we get to praise his name. And that's why we're here today. So let's prepare our hearts for God to continue to work in our life as we gather here. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege to gather in this place at this time to encounter you. We thank you for what you're doing to the ends of the earth. As people are leaving the Islamic faith and coming to know the way, the truth, and the life. And are experiencing salvation at rates that we've never seen before. We're thankful that we get to play a role in that. And we do pray for those today that are ministering in such situations that may be discouraged. We're wondering if it's the sacrifice is worth it. And I pray that they would be encouraged today. They would know that they're being prayed for and they're being supported. Father, we pray for you to do a work in our lives. 
as we see you work to the ends of the earth, we know that you want to work here. And not only do you want to work in this place, you want to work in each of our lives individually. So let us allow you to do that. I pray that as you look upon this place, you see surrender. You see hearts that desire to encounter you today. Hearts that want to bring a sacrifice of praise to you. Hearts that want you to speak. Hearts that are ready to be obedient. Lord, where you don't find that, would we do prepare our hearts? Would we continue to use this worship to reflect the glory to you? Lord, use this time to do great things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We continue to worship. We continue to sing. Let's stand together. I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. Let's stand. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him. seed of Israel's race, ye ransom from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Just repeat after me. Let's sing this. Crown him Lord of all. At his feet we fall. Crown him. Crown him. Hail the King of Kings. Robed in majesty. Crown him, crown him, let every kindred, every tribe on this the rest robot. to him all majesty ascribe and crown him. and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throne we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. declaration here. Crown him Lord of all. At his feet we fall. Crown him. Crown him. Hail the King of Kings. Robed in majesty. Crown him. Crown him, crown him. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, if you would take your copy of God's Word and join us in Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, probably a very familiar passage to you. But as we stand here at this new year, 
I want to remind us of the mission that we've been given. Almost five years ago, my first Sunday as your pastor, we looked at this verse. A couple of years ago, almost to date, we were reminded of our mission. And so I thought it was a great time as uh, we prayed about the new year and prayed about what we need to look at today for us to be reminded of our responsibilities as a church and as individual Christians to fulfill the mission that God has given us. Jesus has been crucified and resurrected. He has been with his disciples. Some of them have doubted, and they've had the opportunity to come and worship him. He has spent time with them. He is about to ascend into heaven, and he leaves his disciples, and he leaves us with these words, beginning in verse 18. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Krista and Jeremy Brazara were looking with anticipation to their wedding this past fall. They had all the plans laid out. They had selected their venue. Everything was great. It was moving forward to the date until they got the call that there was an issue with the venue. And they had to change the location of their wedding. They couldn't find any other place, apparently, where they lived in in Minnesota. There were a whole lot of uh, weddings happening, I guess, in the fall. And so they finally determined that they were going to have the wedding at the firehouse where Jeremy worked. Then they went and talked to the chief and all the people up through the lines and asked for permission to have not just a wedding there, but also the reception. Of course, everyone was excited to have it there. There's not a whole lot of weddings that happen at a fire station. But there was one issue. We could get a call at any moment. And when we do, the alarms are going to go off. The trucks are going to have to leave. People that are at 10-year ceremony are going to have to go. And even the groom could have to leave. Well, they agreed to this. And they made it through the ceremony with no mistakes, no problems. And then they started the reception Right before the bride and groom finished up their pictures to get to go to the reception with everybody else, the alarm went off. There was a large fire in a mutual, in a, in a close by town. They were responding or asking for mutual aid. They were asking for backup. And the department had to go. And Krista looked at Jeremy, and he looked at her for permission to go do what he loves to do. And she told him to go. She was interviewed later by a TV station, and she said this, I've got the rest of my life with him. They needed him at that moment. So he went to fight the fire, knowing that his wedding reception is waiting on him when he got back. And he got back about three hours later for the first dance for bride and groom. And he said, that kind of put the icing on the cake, that she was the one for me for the rest of my life. She let me leave our wedding to go fight a fire. This couple serves as a great reminder for the the church. Serves as a great reminder of our purpose, that we're busy with services, we're busy with Bible studies, we're busy with fellowships, we're busy with all sorts of things, but we must be willing to have our plans interrupted to carry out our mission. And it's a reminder to you as well, you're busy with life, with family obligations, with work obligations, with hobbies, with just life in general, things that are competing for your time, your attention, your efforts, your energies. And we must allow our life to be interrupted to fulfill the mission that God has given us. Our mission is very clear. We are to make disciples. That is the driving force of my ministry. That is the driving force of my leadership as your pastor is that we are to be about making disciples. The central command of this passage, we often refer to as the Great Commission, the only verb in the passage in the Greek text is to make disciples. Go is not there as a verb as it is in the English because there was never a time that the Lord thought that we would not be going The responsibility that you and I have as individuals and as a body of Christ, as a church, is that we are to make disciples. Notice that Jesus did not say, make converts. And maybe that's where we've fallen short. Because the Lord didn't just expect us to say a prayer. He expected us to follow him. He didn't expect us just to say a prayer. He called us to be 
disciples. At the heart of a disciple is the reproduction in others of what Jesus has produced in you. So that you come to faith in him, therefore you desire for that faith to be reproduced in others. So you're sharing the gospel with them so that what happened in your life can happen in theirs. As you grow, what's produced in you, you desire for that to be produced in others. So you're investing in people. You're sharing those things that God does in your life with others. As you obey, you want someone else to obey the way that you obey. As you surrender to his authority, then you want someone else to understand that. And you want them to surrender to his authority. So what God is doing in your life, you're wanting to be produced in someone else. We use that word disciple a lot. What is a disciple? I think you could make a, a short definition of a disciple. Would it be a learner that's commanded to produce more learners? And you never quit learning. So as you learn, you desire to reproduce that in someone else. So that is making disciples. The Lord doing a work in your life that you desire and you're working to reproduce in the lives of others. Unless you're doing that, unless you are reproducing spiritually, unless you are making disciples yourself, scripturally, it's very hard for you to call yourself a disciple. I want that to sink into you. You can say a prayer, you can go to church, you can be baptized, you can do all sorts of things externally. But if you are not reproducing spiritually, if you are not making disciples yourself, then you cannot claim to be a disciple. That's the mission of the church. It's the mission of your life. Recently, we completed I asked over 50 people, 47 individuals completed what was called a church health report. They, it's an online assessment, about 160, 180 questions that they completed about our church to determine how healthy we were in several areas. You'll hear more about that in a couple weeks, but I need to tell you that the lowest area of health in our church is that of discipleship, of making disciples. I want you to think about that. If that's who we are, that's what we're supposed to be about. That's our mission in life. And then to know that we are very unhealthy in that area ought to be alarming to us. It was to me. I expected that area to be kind of one of the higher ups. But of those 47 individuals that took the test, 95% agreed with the statement, I have grown as a Christian since being at church. Looked at that, I was excited about that. We want to see that. But other questions were alarming. Only 20% refuted the statement. I would describe the commitment level of the majority of our members as low. Only 25% disagreed that the lifestyles of the members of our church are significantly different than the world's lifestyle. So I'm thinking about what that says is that 75% would say that there was not a difference. There's not a difference between the way we live our life as a church and the way the world lives. That report seems to suggest to me that we're not growing spiritually. And if we're not growing spiritually, then we don't have anything to reproduce in the lives of others. And so that's why we come back to the central command this great commission to remind us of what you and I are supposed to be about as children of God and as a body of Christ. The great commission. There are four defining factors I see in this passage of the great commission that I want us to understand today. That if you and I are going to grow and then reproduce that growth in others, if we're going to make disciples, we must understand these things. First of all, we have to be intentional. That's the first factor. Jesus tells them, therefore, go and make disciples. Literally, it was just translated, as you were going, make disciples. Again, giving us the idea that the Lord never expected us to be walking alongside, not walking alongside and serving him. He never expected there would be a time that we were not going. So as you are going, as you are living your life, as you are living for me, make disciples. You cannot take the go out of the gospel or the Great Commission. And we will only be intentional when we recognize the authority of the one who gives the commission. Oftentimes we leave out verse 18. 
We look at verse 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus says. Why is that important? Well, during his earthly ministry, Jesus had absolute authority as the Son of God, but his exercise of it was restricted. In his risen state, where he is now at the right hand of the Father, he exercises his absolute supremacy throughout all heaven and earth. As the one with all authority, he rules the plan of establishing God's kingdom throughout the earth. Now I want you to think about that for just a second. That when he was on earth, the stories that you and I have in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, show us the miracles and the power that Jesus had. The miracles he could perform and the power that he had. I mean, he could look at a guy who was lame, and that guy would get up and walk out of the room. He could look at a guy that was full of, of evil spirits, and they would leave him, and he would be restored to a normal life. He could look at a blind man, he could see. A, lame, a, a mute man could talk. You get the picture. He did amazing things. But his, as he had all authority at that time, it was restricted because he was fully human. Now, knowing that, of the, the work that he's done, all the miracles he performed in Scripture, and to know that his authority was restricted at that time, can you imagine what it looks like for all authority in heaven and on earth to be given to him? Can you imagine what he can do without any restriction at all, where he is now in his risen state at the right hand of the Father? Would you let try to wrap your mind around this idea of complete authority that Jesus has? And I think we can summarize it as this. Our mission will not fail. <laughs> if he could do what he did on earth being restricted, and now he has no restrictions at all, our mission will not fail. And we must be intentional about making disciples. Due to our sin nature, we will never stray toward making disciples. We're not just going to wander that way or any other area of obedience. It's not like we're just going to walk, be walking along our life one day and go, oh, you know what, I'm making disciples. We must be intentional. We have to make choices in every area of obedience. Now, I'm going to set my life, I'm going to get on the course where I can make disciples. We must make the decision to be intentional. You look at that in other areas of your life. You struggle with the sin. God convicts you of that. You want to rid that sin of your life. You're very intentional about not going to certain places, being around certain people, thinking certain things, saying certain words. You're very intentional about being obedient. And the same is true about making disciples. It doesn't just happen. We will never stray toward that obedience. We will always stray away from it. And so every day of our life has to be the intentional, conscious choice. I am going to be about making disciples. In baseball and in softball, there's what's called an intentional walk. You're probably familiar with that, but it, if you have a batter come up to the plate that you know is a very good hitter, and you're afraid of what they may do if they make contact, maybe it's a tight ball game, and you don't want them to get another hit, maybe the win and run's on third base, and you want the batter behind them, Instead of facing that hitter that's up to the plate, you intentionally walk that person. Used to, the catcher had to stand there, put their arm out, you threw some pitches off that they caught over here. Now you just tell the umpire and that batter gets to trot down to first base. You intentionally walk them. But there's also things called unintentional walks. That's when this batter is up there, and you don't want to just give them the base, but you're not going to throw them anything very good. You're going to throw every, every ball you throw is going to be a ball, but you're going to see if you can get them to swing at three of them and miss. Or if they connect, it's going to be weak contact. It's going to be off the end of the bat. So you're not going to throw them anything good. And if, as the pitcher, you walk them, you know your coach is okay with that because it was an unintentional walk. I'm afraid many times, as we think of making disciples, while we're supposed to be intentional, what happens is we see some disciples made, we see some life change. We see some growth. We see people place their faith in Jesus and grow in knowledge and understanding of him. People who are growing in the walk with Christ. But we're not intentional about that. It just kind of happens as we live our life. We're trying to be obedient, so we got some opportunities here. We see somebody that's open over here. And so we, we uh, invest in that person, and we begin to see some growth. And then we move on to the next one. 
I don't want to minimize what happened. What's happened in the life of our church is we see growth and see people come to faith in Jesus. But can you imagine what would happen if we were intentional? I think much of what our, we would call disciple making has been unintentional. It's just kind of happened. But it hasn't happened the way that we would like for it to happen. Think about in times when we're very intentional as a church. The greatest time of that probably is vacation Bible school. And we're intentional that for a week we're going to teach kids, and we know that Wednesday and Thursday of that week the kids are going to be challenged to place their faith in Jesus Christ. We're very intentional on that. Therefore, it's no coincidence that for the last several years, the vast majority of the salvations that's happened in our church have happened through vacation Bible school. Why? Because we're intentional. Now take that intentionality and apply it to your life. What could happen if you knew, not just for a certain week, but for every day of your life, you were going to look for opportunities to invest in someone? That you were going to look for opportunities to reproduce in someone else's life what God has produced in yours? And maybe that's the issue. Maybe we are not growing. Therefore, there's nothing to reproduce. Our intentionality must begin at home, by the way. Deuteronomy 6 comes right after the Ten Commandments are given. The laws are being given. And it's in that time that the Lord commands the people, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and write them excuse me, and bind them on your foreheads. Bind them on, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Do you see the intentionality there in that verse? That we are to impress these things on our children. That's where it starts, is at home. As parents, we are to be very intentional. We should be very intentional about making disciples of our children, reproducing in their life what the Lord has produced in ours. Some of you today are grandparents, and you look at your grandchildren, and you're concerned about the lack of intentionality by your grown children. You scratch your head and wonder how they would raise their kids the way they do, because you know how you raised them. And you're heartbroken over that. You're frustrated. And I would challenge you today to look for ways in which you can be intentional. Think about how you can invest in that grandchild. Some of your parents, you're here, you're frustrated. Maybe the way your child's acting or the lack of progress that you see, or you're really counting down the years to you're an empty nester. And if you'd be honest, maybe you're facing a lot of things you're facing because you haven't been intentional. All of us have people in our life that we look and we're frustrated. We'd like for them to be different than they are. Have we been intentional? We will never make disciples without the intentional choice to do so. Beginning with allowing God to work in our life to see growth that we can produce in others. There's a second factor, and that's that we must be missional. Missional is kind of one of those hot words, hot topic words among the church the last few years. There's a lot of books written on being missional. What that simply means is to be sent. If we're to be missional, we are to be sent into the world. That we don't expect people to come to us, but we go to them. And it's that posture that differentiates between a missional church and an attractional church. Do we want them to come here, or are we willing to go to them? Go and make disciples of all nations. Most people take this to mean you have to go and stay. You have to relocate. You have to change everything that's normal to you. You've got to sell your house, quit your job, try to figure out how you're going to learn another language, and you have to relocate to another country where you're not going to know the language, you're going to wear a loincloth, and you're not going to have much to eat but rice, and all of life's going to be different. And so that's how we think of being sent, so therefore we don't want to go. I don't want to sign up for that. But that's not what the Lord is speaking on. See, going means more than traveling across geographical borders. The point is that believers are to be active. We are to be out as a sent people, 
Instead of hibernating, we are to be active in the world. Yes, to obey Jesus' command may require some to leave their homeland and go to other places of the world. I'm thankful for those that have done that, that are willing to be obedient, that are representing you and I, even as we gather here, as we already spoke of, that are in places many can't even be named where these places are. They live in such a spot. But they're living as a sent people. But the nature of this commission requires all believers to be involved in it. We are all called to be involved in calling unbelievers to be converted and to join us in the process of being transformed to the image of Jesus in lifelong discipleship. That is everybody's call here, mine and yours. We must live as a sent people. Neil Cole is an author and a pastor who's written a lot about missional communities that are willing to go where no one else goes rather than have people come to them. He writes a book where he speaks of communities or churches that are meeting in various communities, including pubs and community centers and simple living rooms. One particular church that he describes meets in a coffee house. And after the small group of people there experience some growth, they begin to send out among their group missionaries to start a church in another house called Portfolios. Neil Cole describes Portfolios as a coven for witches, warlocks, Satanists, and vampires. He's speaking to people here who literally had decided to live life according to the typical vampire narrative. They sleep in coffins, they file their teeth to the point of being fangs, and they only come out at night. And this group of people has gone into that community, and they've seen surprising growth. We don't have time, but he began to share the story about Manuel. And he had a conversation, one individual had a conversation with Emmanuel. Emmanuel placed his faith in Jesus Christ and was baptized at a beach within a week. And a few weeks later, Emmanuel was baptizing someone himself in the same beach. And he baptized somebody else a few weeks after that. And within a short time, a second church was started from the converts from portfolios. Then a short time later, a third was started. Out of this rich, dark soul of this pocket of people that most of us would run from. But people living missionally go to them and are seeing lives being changed. Could it be that the lack of reproducing in our life is because we don't live as a sent people? We wouldn't turn anybody away that came and asked us about our faith, but we're not going to them. We're not engaging in people. We're not going to people that aren't like us. We're not going to those dark places. But we have the mindset, and I've heard it. Many of you have it. They know where we're at. They know when we have church, and they can come here if they want to come. Some of you need to understand the vast majority of people in this community do not know where we are. And they do not know where, when we meet, other than Sunday. People that have lived here their whole life will ask me just about every week, now exactly where is your church? Grand Avenue, you know, just down from the hospital, if you're coming down toward Canal. No. You know, you cross the tracks. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. That, the big building there. Yes, that's it. Okay. Never put it together. We expect them to come, but they don't know where to come. Probably some of you that are here today for the first time had a tough time knowing which door to come when you got here. There's not but about 47 different doors you could enter. Maybe not that many, maybe just 35. But think about it. We expect someone to come, and they come. Then where do they go? We can't have an attractional ministry. We must be missional. We must, if we're going to make disciples, be willing to be sent out intentionally to engage people to reproduce what God has produced in us. There's a third defining factor, and that's that we must be directional. The Great Commission extends to all nations. Go and make disciples of all nations, meaning all people or all ethnic groups. Going means crossing boundaries to make disciples. So not everybody's going across large bodies of water, but maybe it's going across the street. 
Maybe it's having a heart-to-heart conversation with that loved one that you know is destined for hell if the Lord were to return or call them home today. It's going beyond our comfort zone to make the gospel accessible to the lost. We are called to live with a going purpose, with a sent purpose every day of our life. And we will not go until we're burdened. And we will not be burdened until we remember what it's like to live without Jesus. Jesus' instruction here were to teach. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. This instruction supports the directional aspect here. Because in Jesus' day, it was only the privileged young men that were taught by an established rabbi. If you didn't have the means by which to get an education, you didn't get it. If you were a female, you were never going to be taught. And if your family didn't have the means in which to pay for it, you would be a male with no education. So when Jesus tells us to teach them everything he's commanded, he breaks down the barriers and reminds us that all of his disciples must be taught to obey everything he's commanded. That's men and women. That's rich and poor. That's Jew and Gentile. That those barriers are broke down because we must be directional, willing to go to all places. We cannot pick and choose. We are to minister impersonally with a directional focus to go everywhere. A little over a year ago, one of my mentors, Dr. Sonny Tucker, stood in this spot. He preached to us on a Sunday morning last October. And he talked to us about making disciples, about reaching out. And he made a statement I heard him make before and since then, but that we're out of good sinners. Remember that, maybe? That we're out of good sinners. That those that are, we would say are good sinners to have an interest in being involved in the church, to have an interest in connecting with Christians and living a life that pleases God, those folks have a connection to a church. Whether they're active or not, they have a place that they call home, a place that they belong. But it's those folks that we would look at that aren't like us. Don't live the lifestyle that we live. Don't have the socioeconomic standing that maybe you have that are just different from us. And those are the people that we must be reminded of is our responsibility to reach. Those are the ones that are a little harder to disciple, by the way. They are not just as open about you investing in them. They can handle things themselves, even though their life is completely messed up. They would be okay if you did not bother them. They would tell you, I know where you are if I need you. And that's who we're called to make disciples of. The Lord didn't say, go and make disciples of those that are easy to make. Go and make disciples of those who look like you and who act like you and who talk like you and who live like you. Go connect with those that you're comfortable with. No. Because he had, if he had not included that of all nations, all peoples, all ethnic groups, he knew that the church today would look just like us. That we would never reach beyond ourselves if He had not instructed us to do so. And that's why we must be intentional. And to live as a sent people with direction. And we must understand that the world has come to us. You don't believe it? Go buy gas in Yazoo City today. Go out to eat today. And you will realize that the world has come to us. Because not everybody that's going to take your money at the gas station, not everybody that's going to fix your food or serve your table is going to look like you. They're not going to speak English very clear. And oftentimes we're derogatory toward them rather than being intentional toward reaching them. And we see these folks. We know that they, many of them, have a faith that is a lie, that they are going to hell, And we act like we don't care. The world has come to us. 
We no longer have to worry about going all the time because they're here. Go to a college campus and you'll see the world's come to us. Go to a hospital. You'll see the world's come to us. And rather than fussing about that doctor that you can't quite understand, why don't you understand the spiritual need that doctor has? And then we love to talk about and even financially support missions and ministries around the world. But we refuse to be involved in the same thing in our own backyard. I have a problem with that, by the way. That's not being intentional. That's not being missional. That's not being directional. We're good. We love to invite people in to speak to us. Some of you heard a few weeks ago, you sat and listened to a man tell you about inner city ministry in Jackson, but you won't be involved in that right here. Everything he shared with you, you have the opportunity right here in your community, but you won't do that. You're not being a disciple. You're not living in obedience to the Great Commission. The last part, the last factor of the Great Commission is celebrational. I can tell you without verse 20, the last sentence, I probably would have gave up a long time ago. And surely I will be with, you, be with you always to the very end of the age. Surely I will be. You can count on it. Think about it in the original context. Jesus is talking to some guys that their minds are blown. They saw him be killed in the worst way possible. They've seen him in his resurrected state. Some of them have doubted. They've come and they've worshipped him. And now he's about to leave. And they're thinking, how in the world are we going to live now? They were scared to death beforehand, locked in a room. And he just appeared to them. And they're thinking, now he, he's, he's telling us he's going to leave again. What are we supposed to do? And then he tells them, listen, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, I expect you to go and make disciples of all nations. And they're thinking, all nations, all peoples, how are we going to get outside of where we are right now? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And they're thinking, man, what a tall order. We've got to go to all nations, all peoples, all ethnic groups, and we've got to teach. It's open to everybody. And then they hear those words, and know that I am with you, even to the end of time. Know that I am with you. Jesus was given the name Emmanuel. We just came out of Christmas season where we talk about that, which means God with us. And as we obey this commission, we are comforted by the awareness that the risen Jesus will continue to mold all of his disciples, that he is with us. He's present as his, as his disciples go throughout the nations with the gospel of the kingdom of God, inviting all to become his disciples. Jesus is present as new disciples are baptized and are taught to obey everything that he has commanded. Jesus is present as maturing believers go throughout the stages of their life. Jesus is present as the church journeys through this age awaiting his return. Jesus is always present for his disciples to follow their master. Surely, I will be with you always. And his co continual presence invites us into the story. And we shouldn't meet this passage with fear. We shouldn't come to it with guilt, but it should spur us all to make disciples. That Jesus is saying, I'm going to be with you. And when I'm with you, nothing can stop you. Nothing can stop my work if we would just be obedient. We ought to celebrate the fact that nowhere will we go apart from him. He goes before us, preparing the way. All we have to do is walk in obedience. So parent, when you're frustrated and thinking, how do I disciple this child? Follow Jesus. And grandparent, as you wonder why your grandkids are being raised the way they are, and you want to step up and do something about it, you want to have that tough conversation, the Lord is with you. Follow him. And as we begin to realize that we must not be limited, but we must be directional. We must not put any limits at all upon the gospel, where we'll go, how far we'll go, or what we'll do, that we realize that the Lord is with us, surely. And so we go following him. But there's another part of this celebration that you got to see earlier. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Celebration includes baptism. Baptism represents the identification of people to a new way of life and faith. And it should be experienced as soon as possible after a person places their faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus never considered someone not being baptized. So today, if you're here and you have a relationship with Jesus, and you've never been baptized, you've never made that public, that's the first step in following him is baptism. And so maybe that's what needs to happen in your life today to be a disciple, to begin to grow, is you need to take step one. Jesus never intended us not to be baptized. Now, there's instances where people cannot be. It does not affect their salvation. But those instances are rare. Someone on their deathbed that places their faith in Jesus, that times cannot happen. But we ought to desire immediately to follow in baptism. It is the outward expression of seeing people changed. The outward expression of people seeing themselves as citizens of God's kingdom, as children of God, and as brothers and sisters with the rest of the family of believers. And so our mission is to bring people to where they see themselves differently because they have become different through the transforming work of God's grace. And so, the celebration that ensues with baptism. You applaud it. That was a celebration of of sorts. But you know what? We don't celebrate enough. Because we're not intentional enough. We're not missional. We're not directional. So we don't get to be celebrational. Luke chapter 15 shows the celebration that occurs when the lost is found. There's three stories there in this one parable. You know them. The parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. The man had a hundred sheep. He loses one. He leaves the 99 to go find the one. The person has ten coins. They lose one. They search the house over for that one coin. The man has two sons. One wanders away, and he waits for that child to come home, and he runs out to meet him and to welcome him home. And the celebration ensues when the one sheep is found, when the one coin is found, and when the one son is found. And as you read those three stories, they get more personal, don't they? You got a hundred sheep, you lose one. You got ten coins, you lose one. You got two sons, you lose one. And this father waited for his son to come home and Imagine waiting prayerfully, probably hearing reports about his son and how he lived his life. And when his boy came home, they had a party because the son who was lost had been found. And we can look all around us. If you open your eyes, you don't have to look far to see God is working in ways that are worth celebrating. People's lives are being changed. People are growing. People are being challenged. You've even been challenged today. What you've heard is not every word has been comfortable to hear, just as it hadn't been comfortable to proclaim. So it comes back to the question, are you celebrating? You can't celebrate if you're not involved in the work. Because you may think, well, we don't see people's life being changed. You just said we're not baptizing enough. We're not celebrating enough. But if you were involved in the work, you would know. You would see. So bottom line is, are you making disciples? Are you involved in the work? And are you making disciples? We think a lot about the end of our life and hearing the words, well done, good and faithful servant. I think we throw those around real flippantly. Apply those to people that will never hear those words. But just suppose that when you enter heaven and you see Jesus, that the first words that he were to speak to you would come from this passage. And he were to ask you, did you make disciples? How would you answer him? Who could you present to our loving Lord? Yes, Lord, I did. And it started with those children that you gave me to raise 
And I wasn't perfect, Lord, I was far from it. But I did my best to reproduce in them what you did in me. Lord, you know that boy down the street that I used to drive by every Sunday? I'd read his name in the paper later. I was burdened for him. And I invested in him to reproduce what you did in me. In my classmates, in my co-workers, and that waitress that got my order wrong, I couldn't hardly understand her. Her, Lord. Or would we stand there in the face of our loving Lord in the full expectation of, and the excitement of being in heaven, would it be diminished for a moment as we stand there and say, Lord, I, I was busy. Lord, I built a great company. Lord, I tried to raise my kids right, teach them right from wrong, but I can't say I discipled them. I worked hard, Lord. Lord, I served in your church. But what disciples did you make? And we would be faced to realize that we lived our whole life unintentionally. Not being missional. Forget about any direction. We were so focused on ourselves, And that we missed out on the celebration. Because I believe every time that we get to celebrate the work of God, we get a little glimpse into heaven. Because by the way, I think heaven's a great celebration. But every time a sinner repents and places faith in Jesus Christ, not only should there be celebration in our lives, but all of heaven gathers around there's a celebration in heaven that's scriptural and that needs to be happening because of me and because of you church let us not forget our mission let us make disciples would you bow with me with heads bowed and eyes closed I want you in the quietness of this place to think about that question I just asked you are you making disciples if you don't make it home from this place or if you don't live till tomorrow and you stand before Jesus, he's going to ask you, why should he allow you into his kingdom? If you place your faith in his son, Jesus Christ, and the son of God, then your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, Scripture tells us. And there you will find your name and your entrance was guaranteed into heaven. So today I would ask you, first of all, is your name written in the book? Have you come to the place and time in your life when you placed your faith in Jesus, surrendered your life to him, experienced his forgiveness, and you could be called a disciple. Have you followed in baptism of that? It's step one of you being obedient. And then, when he asks you, have you made any disciples? Who could you speak of? Who could you say, yes, Lord, what you did in me has been reproduced in that person. Your faith reproduced in them. The obedience you taught me reproduced in them. The surrender to authority reproduced in them. Father, today create in us the desire and the burden to make disciples. To simply be obedient to your com commission, your command to us. I pray for your forgiveness upon us today as we acknowledge that we haven't been great in that area. And help us individually so that it impacts us as a church to address that today in our lives. As you've spoken, let us be obedient today. Let's make adjustments. Let's be willing to live an intentional life Let's be willing to be sent without any limit to the direction that we will go. Lord, maybe even as we pray, heaven's gathered around because a celebration needs to happen in here because the one needs to place their faith in you. Let this time be full of celebration as your people are obedient to your call upon their life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand together as we sing? This altar's open. We'll be here to receive you. If you have a public commitment to come, would you come quickly as we sing?
Take my life, lead me, Lord. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Make my life useful to Thee. Take my life. thank you so much for the message the pastor just shared with us that you had given to him lord help us to be convicted and empowered to be disciple makers and especially dedicate ourselves uh, as individuals and a church to do that this year lord we thank you for the sunshine that we see outside it just lifts our hearts we do know you're in control lord lord we dedicate these uh, offerings uh, to you and your services and help us, Lord, to serve you in the right way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
What a day that will be. And until then, God has responsibilities for us. And I pray that we'll be found faithful in making disciples. Hope you have a great rest of the day and a great uh, first part of the week. I encourage you to be back Wednesday. We're back on schedule Wednesday with our uh, services at 6 o'clock. There's a new women's Bible study starting at the same time. Uh, will be no meal this week. That'll start back the next week. Uh, but hope that you uh, will be here to join us Wednesday. Notice other things in your bulletin. Uh, please continue to sign up to get your directory pictures made. This is the last week, I believe, uh, for you to sign up. So we're waiting on you if you haven't done that yet. And so if you would do that, uh, and also two weeks from today, make note and plan to be here for it's our annual meeting, uh, something required by the state for us to have. But more importantly to me, it's a time for us to look back at the last year, look ahead at this year, and celebrate what God has done. And so we will do that. Uh, also, we'll have our chili cook-off during that time. It's always a, a good time, but it's one of the most important times in the life of our church. So I hope that you'll plan to be here uh, two weeks from today. Uh, as we go, we're able to reproduce what God has done in our life because of his grace and the fact that he has, saved, he has saved us and he's removed the chains of sin from our life. So let's stand together and let's declare that in song as we're dismissed today. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns.